Hello, and welcome to our podcast, the go-to source for professionals that are looking to enrich visitor experience with digital innovation, whether for museums, heritage sites, or travel attractions. I'm Shahar Grambeck, and I'll be your host. I would like to welcome you all, whether you're a curator, experience manager, or simply passionate about cultural heritage. This podcast is for you. Together, we'll talk about practical tips industry insights and inspiring stories to help you captivate and educate your visitors. Today, we're thrilled to have James Houston with us. James is an expert in blending technology with cultural heritage. His work in particularly on AI, in art restoration and enhancing visitor experience in museum through digital innovation has been groundbreaking. He brings unique perspective on how technology can transform museums and heritage sites. James, it's wonderful to have you here. We're all curious to hear more about you and your fascinating journey in the world of technology and cultural heritage. Could you please tell us a bit about uh, yourself? Absolutely, thank you. It's great to be here and I hope we can offer some uh, actionable uh, resources and guidance as well as point to additional um, uh, resources and materials for a wide range of cultural heritage institutions and professionals. Um, uh, my background actually is going to be originally in art history, so I got a master's and a PhD uh, in art history, specializing in early modern Italian um, art specifically. Um, um, so then I went on to teach for about a decade um, uh, or so, becoming department head in that area, but then um, became um, uh, interested in extended reality, specifically virtual reality, right before the pandemic hit. So I set up an XR research lab for us here. We also had a very large um, game design department, and uh, one of the ways in which you can create these cultural heritage spaces, and we'll talk about one of the projects we're working on right now with the University of Mosul in Iraq, um, uh, is in game engines to recreate entire, um, uh, uh, you can recreate an entire city if you would like, but uh, certainly an entire museum, uh, various structures, reconstituting things that may not have been there. So I also got a master's degree in game design uh, to assist with that. Um, uh, after we set up the XR lab, um, uh, obviously we wanted to see what could be done with cultural heritage. Of course, this is during the pandemic. Um, uh, we were looking at different ways in which to collapse space and time since people could not travel and they were on lockdown. Uh, so how do we continue to provide these types of culturally enriching experiences to those you know, around the world and certainly to our students who couldn't travel to Europe and or Asia, uh, South America, you know, anywhere really um, outside of where we're at in the middle of the continental United States. And so uh, we started uh, uh, bringing them into these immersive experiences, giving them virtual tours in small groups, um, having them take us to where they were from. We have students all over the world. So we'd have them take us to where they're from, you know, in Germany and Abu Dhabi, and once again, India, uh, show us their hometowns, uh, their favorite things. And so we were able to get a type of pedagogical experience down that can be um, adopted by museums as well um, uh, in order to further enhance their experiences. And of course, this last year, um, if you think of 2022 being the year of um, uh, the metaverse being the word of the year, certainly the word this year is AI. So I also went out and um, uh, was put in charge of an institutional research uh, strategy to integrate AI across various areas. And so um, and we put together the AI ambassadors and we can talk about how you can do these things as well um, with any institution with little or no training or resources, or even if you are at scale. Um, uh, and so then I just finished up a PhD in artificial intelligence as well, just to make sure that um, um, uh, we knew all the ins and outs. So trying to marry emergent technologies, including AI and XR, um, to support uh, the experience of cultural heritage preservation, um, uh, visitation, and or um, uh, ways in which to engage with it more immersively. Amazing. I mean, both uh, your combination with uh... Uh, with both uh, technology and uh, cultural heritage is, is very unique. So uh, thanks for for being with us. Uh, the first question the first question I thought uh, asking you is about digital storytelling and visitor engagement. So uh, you've looked in, uh, you've looked at how museums tell stories using digital tools. What do you think about the future of that? And how how do you think that can museums 
use it to make their displays more uh, educational and emotionally engaging. Absolutely. There's actually a, um, a way in which you can think about the future starts now and then plan out um, different stages of adoption. So everyone can start given certain strategies. And we have a book coming out on inclusive smart museums, which lays out all these strategies. It should be out um, uh, the first of the year. Um, uh, we just finished up the final copy editing yesterday, actually. Um, um, but uh, storytelling, of course, is one of the most powerful uh, ways in which we can communicate um, uh, ideas and uh, concepts, belief systems, right? So cultural ideas um, uh, across generations. So it's one of the oldest forms of uh, communication strategies that we have. Um, uh, now, looking past merely uh, live or synchronous storytelling, uh, digital storytelling affords the ability to um, uh, have a an interaction and engagement with a particular narrative, right, um, across time. And what that means is um, the storytelling element, whatever your uh, your site, your museum, and or what you're looking at should begin well before the visit, right? So you need to think about people finding um, uh, your site, looking at what's up there on a website or a mobile app. Um, uh, you have lots of very um, uh, easy and inexpensive drag and drop options for websites um, that are out there um, that you can then add different multimedia content. Um, uh, but then, of course, your social media is also very important. So you want to start the storytelling before they even arrive. And I know eventually we will be talking about how to address different um, uh, neurodiverse audiences, but you also want to be able to show them where the museum is located and then how the parking lot is structured, how to move through the museum. And that can be done with um, any iPhone past generation 10 and or iPad. So most people have access to these technologies to go out and make that and link it to their website so that people can move physically through the space as they are learning about the story as well. But traditional storytelling elements may be um, a wall text or a placard um, uh, that may give a paragraph worth of information, which is of course static and unchanging. Um, uh, now we have more um, um, uh, digital uh, 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 touchscreen displays, which allow certain types of interaction. That was um, uh, pulled back quite a bit due to COVID and not wanting to touch uh, surfaces that other people were touching. And so um, now the easiest way to get started is to build that into devices that everyone already has on their person. So obviously people can go into museums and, um, uh, and rent different types of audio devices and push buttons, which will then give them a pre-recorded um, uh, uh, synopsis or introduction or overview of whatever the object is they're looking at. But again, that is not interactive. It is pre-recorded. And so ways in which you can do that now with new types of, uh, of API with generative AI is, of course, build on that. And then um, uh, as we just did with the founder of our university, um, uh, you can upload all the primary source documents associated with a given object. Object, you give it once again a prompt for your own uh, chat bot that you can create um, in a bespoke basis for free, and it's relatively easy to do. Um, uh, uh, we, we set this up uh, just in five minutes last week, and then we sent off an article on it. Um, uh, so Mary Sibley was the founder of our institution. We had all of her diaries, all of her letters. We took all those and uploaded it. We gave her a voice and style. We, um, uh, we tested it with uh, archivists and specialists. Um, so you need historical and experts on the subject in the loop to make sure that how the audience is interacting and the questions they might ask would be relatively historically accurate for that individual place and or event. Um, uh, and then through a manner of, uh, of tweaking, we can then, you know, uh, have that in the palm of your hand with your smartphone while they're in front of something and you can engage with it and make, okay, that's interesting. What is that in the background? Why is that red? Why is there a cow there? Why specifically is it is it this structure or why is it polished or rough, et cetera? And so they can ask these questions that um, otherwise would be static. But, uh, but storytelling, especially digital storytelling, um, it shouldn't just stop there. So you think before engaging your audience uh, through social media, your website content, some multimedia, some videos, you know, to get them interested in telling them the context of what they'll be seeing, um, uh, make them comfortable about how to get there and move through the space. 
then on site, give them interactive elements um, uh, that draw their attention, but let them control the experience and uh, customize it. That's the future of, of engagement is customized tours through museums, personalizing it. And then afterwards, continue to engage them through gamification strategies on social media by giving them certain awards and or like discounts to um, uh, to the gift shop and or to once again, a restaurant, right, to draw them back to continue posting so that they continue the, um, the storytelling kind of elements after that, that then um, has their social group engaged with it. And then the, the loop continues. So you want to keep feeding that, um, uh, that loop for uh, visitor engagement. Sounds amazing. I mean, the example that you had about the AI language model of uh, of uh, uh, of bringing alive a person that you have uh, writings of that, that person on on one side might some might say it's like a, an episode in, in Black Mirror, but other mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, it's a huge opportunity uh, for people to engage with uh, historical figures uh, to personalize and ask specific questions. So uh, I think it's amazing for uh, for engagement and has a lot of opportunity uh, for uh, uh, for historical professionals uh, to uh, engage, uh, especially the younger generation. Um, if I may uh, um, have a follow up question about uh, about uh, storytelling, I mean, what do you think are the key elements uh, that make makes uh, a successful digital storytelling? Uh, one that uh, captures the audience tension and, and interest. Absolutely. So regardless of whether or not it's an historical figure, an event, um, uh, an object, um, uh, if it's a science museum, it doesn't really matter. You need um, a, a compelling narrative. So uh, so obviously, if you can um, um, uh, provide an overview or some type of insight into uh, even anthropomorphizing certain things, so even if you're talking about a ship or you're talking about, you know, uh, some mechanical devices, um, showing how it is going to be important, interesting anecdotes about how it affected people's lives, but really giving a type of, um, um, of dynamic story to it. So even if it's something as mundane as screws being invented, right, in the, in the 18th century, and encyclopedias, you know, showing what different types there were, right? So talk about um, uh, the challenges that led to that and the need and what that led to with the Industrial Revolution and, um, uh, and what something as simple as a tiny screw or something holds um, a larger object together could actually um, uh, could, could do. So um, being able to take the mundane and be able to anchor it into um, uh, our lived experience um, uh, is central to this. So especially if it's going to be presenting uh, cultures that are different than one's own or belief systems and or um, uh, religions, for instance, you know, showing the commonality of, of human experience, you know, showcasing not the difference, but how you you can um, understand something that is different than yourself to develop this type of global citizenship and empathy um, uh, through shared kind of human biography and experiences. Sounds great. Um, uh, another question that I uh, thought to myself before uh, before the session. Um, I mean, on the one hand, there is authenticity, authenticity, and the other uh, is technology. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts about uh, how museum curators can balance between the innovation aspects of AI and preserving the authenticity of uh, educational value uh, of their exhibits? Exactly. Um, uh, and we're going to be dealing more and more with this because um, in our research into reconstituting things that were damaged or destroyed with new AI tools, um, uh, you know, stable diffusion and others. We have studies out there. We, we're happy to share of how to do this. Anyone can do it and it's free. Um, um, uh, even building up 3D models and outputting things to 3D fabrication. Um, uh, but what that means is the more information we have, so if we have 10,000 objects, but maybe five were destroyed, we can get aggregate data and, and get relatively close to what those would have looked like based upon all the other examples. And so you're absolutely right. If we think about authenticity and the educational value, we need to first, you know, um, uh, kind of anchor what do we mean by authentic? What are the educational outcomes we hope to achieve? And then balance those. So as we were mentioning, 
Um, uh, we have several studies on digital necromancy or digital resurrection. You know, what about AI clones of uh, historical figures that are no longer with us? Um, uh, obviously, there are lots of ethical implications for contemporary figures, that being, you know, um, whether or not you give consent to having yourself recreated. But more practically, from an educational standpoint, and that speaks to your question, we would want to think about um, uh, the audience and how authentic do we really want it, right? Because there are different audiences. So um, obviously, everyone listening to this um, probably has a specific constituency or audience or visitor in mind or different types that, that um, uh, they can think of demographics that are visiting their location or site. Um, uh, and so keeping that in mind and making sure that you flexibly can meet the learning outcomes in uh, um, a nomenclature, a vernacular, a, um, a way in which would be appropriate to different groups. I mean, obviously, children such as mine that are eight years and younger um, uh, would not need to really go into the specifics if they were going to have a night in the museum type experience with Genghis Khan and or other, you know, kind of, you know, genocidal kind of um, uh, historical figures. But we would still need them to understand that um, that was an important historical figure that changed the shape and the very climate of the planet. So, um, uh, so figuring out, okay, we need them to know this. So, so how authentic by our definition does that need to be? If it's an adult population for the general public, obviously you can give a bit more anecdotal information, get them interested by throwing in some, uh, some interesting stories and details. But then you also have your experts, your researchers, your archivists, your historians. And so you would want to give um, more the primary source, et cetera. So um, uh, in the example we just did with Mary Sibley, for instance, the founder of this institution back in 1833, um, they own slaves. And so, you know, we, we grappled with how to address the notion of slavery if you're going to have um, this interacting with children. She was also very, very religious and Presbyterian. So um, uh, so how do we balance how authentic we want to make sure people understood life was like in the early 1830s, you know, um, uh, with all the information we need versus balancing it with our current worldview and sensibilities, right? So obviously, um, uh, truly authentic historical experiences are not uh, wouldn't be appropriate for the general public, right? It would be um, um, uh, 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 it would be counterproductive in in certain circumstances. Um, uh, however, there's still the authenticity, I believe you were mentioning, of the object itself. So, uh, objectness, objecthood, phenomenology. So you might have um, an object like a pulley system, for instance, that was used to create the Florentine Duomo, right? So obviously the, the pulley system um, uh, is a rather mundane object, um, uh, but it's the original one that existed, you know, over 500 years ago um, uh, to do that. And so that's, that's authentic, but it doesn't really give a sense of what the structural um, components and the building of, of the Florentine Cathedral looked like. So instead you have, when you go into the Museo del Opera del Duomo in Florence, you have um, uh, these videos, multimedia um, uh, reconstructions of stage by stage. You have the models, et cetera. So adding the context must be balanced with authenticity. Um, uh, because you're all you're also balancing, you know, what you as a curator or as a, as an expert, an archivist, whatever that might be, um, uh, have very intimate knowledge and feel very strongly about a given object. But the significance of that may be completely lost on the general public. So you have to balance the authenticity of what you know it is with um, uh, engaging content, right, um, uh, using these tools, which are easy to do um, uh, in this way uh, to express the, the importance of it, to communicate why you feel the way you do about this object. What did it mean at the time? What was the significance, you know, uh, of it? How can that help us, more importantly, understand ourselves better as a society? Right. So that's really what great exhibitions and experiences do is give you a revelation about your place in the universe. Sounds fantastic. Uh, one point that you mentioned uh, is, is, is something that uh, I find very important personally, which is adapting the, uh, the exhibits and the content for the various uh, types of audiences. Uh, you mentioned uh, children and uh, the various uh, types of uh, uh, audience groups. Um, one uh, one I would say is about inclusiveness, uh, and uh, and uh, you, you wrote a few uh, articles and uh, research about uh, innovations for accessibility and more specifically to neurodiversity. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, how AR and VR uh, can help museums 
uh, become a better places for visitors who experience the world uh, a, li- a little bit different than uh, than uh, the average person. Absolutely. There's a, a variety of neurotypes, and I guess we should start by noting the latest research in neurodiversity just refers to all the ways in which we experience the world and our mind processes um, external stimuli. So um, neuro, neurotypical individuals would be those that are considered um, to operate, quote unquote, normally, whereas neurodivergent individuals process sensory information differently. That includes, of course, autism spectrum condition, dyslexia, dysgraphia, Tourette's, um, uh, and, and the list goes on there. So the this it's a very broad um, type of scale. So you must think of it as a, as a spectrum of uh, of experience that um, may uh, be sensitive to sound, to light, to um, uh, to social situations, crowds, smells, right? Um, uh, especially we don't think about. And so um, uh, in thinking about how to address um, and make it more inclusive for everyone, including the neurotypical or your average visitor who may not have sensory processing conditions, um, uh, um, the the strategies apply to all. So the first strategy as far as AR and VR is that we know um, through our studies that um, uh, neurodivergent individuals um, uh, won't visit a place if they don't know what to expect. And so it's like the anxiety you get if you're going to a party and you don't know who's going to be there or you don't know, you know, what type of what to wear, if it's going to be formal or informal and that type of uncertainty. You know, we, we have that kind of, you know, general anxiety, but it's multiplied, you know, um, uh, much more intensely with other uh, neurodivergent conditions. And so uh, the first thing that can be done, which is relatively easy, is making a digital twin of your exhibition, museum, um, parking lot, right? Everyone, I, I want to emphasize this or or how you walk to or enter or exit the structure right that's that's very often overlooked um, um, uh, and so making those digital twins is, is is relatively cheap and easy now right and you can view them obviously through things like you know matterport on your desktop or and once again in a headset but at the very least making a, a mobile friendly and a website friendly and then it could also be used for a full uh, head mounted display a uh, digital twin of what people will experience what is the lighting going to be like um, what is the space right how do we move through it um, uh, uh, and that simple um, uh, um, uh, step ahead of visitation uh, improves once again um, uh, the number of visitors, but it also works for neurotypical visitors as well. They want to see this as well. I can't think of the last time I haven't went to a new restaurant or a new place to meet a colleague and didn't go to Google Maps or something first and looked at you know what's it, what does it look like, what is the street, you know what is the scene, so I can um, uh, familiarize myself. And uh, and most people do that whether they know it or not. Now it's kind of expected. But it's important for this population to have that type of information ahead of time. Additionally, um, uh, obviously, we're talking about, you know, augmented reality. Um, uh, We already have the meta ray bands, um, uh, the the second version of them that that are out now. But, you know, by this time next year, um, uh, everyone's going to have an Apple version of the smart glasses that allows you to transition from uh, full reality, like I'm viewing the screen right now, talking to everyone here, um, uh, to mixed reality or um, or I should say augmented reality, overlaying some digital elements on top of it, like Pokemon Go or something, or a Snapchat filter, giving me puppy dog ears, right? To mixed reality, which is taking my environment, but maybe the roof comes off and a giant, you know, Diplodocus or Brontosaurus head comes in. You've seen those in theaters. And then full virtual reality, which is completely blocking out the outside world and, uh, and giving me a simulation, not taking into context where I'm at. And so um, uh, as far as neurodivergent individuals are concerned, many have uh, processing um, uh, disorders with um, associated with uh, uh, visual and auditory processing. And so uh, through these things, I mean, for instance, um, uh, uh, my wife, who's neuroacquired and my co-author always wears glasses with pink lenses um, uh, in order to um, uh, tone down um, uh, the visual stimuli that she's getting. Other people wear earplugs, for instance, uh, to control the auditory information coming in. And that's what the glasses do. If you if you look at the most recent version of the smart glasses, they have localized sound. And so you don't have anything in your ears, but you're the only
only one that can hear it and it, it, it can block out or control um, uh, the signals you're getting from your uh, your ambient environment. So maybe you want to only hear someone next to you and not everyone else at a party um, that's drowning them out. You can then um, uh, uh, filter that that background noise out. So uh, these technologies um, uh, are, of course, useful for most neurotypicals, but are life changing for people that would be overwhelmed and have a panic attack otherwise in these situations. Now, I should state that um, uh, simpler ways to start that and, and thinking about mapping out what you might do are things like uh, sensory maps. Right. And so taking your your institution and then identifying where are the areas with bright or low lights, where are the areas with um, uh, loud sounds uh, that people might encounter, like choke points at entrance or egress points where there'll be a lot of people talking. Um, uh, where were there places that's going to have strong odors, right, like walking past the restrooms or something? Where would that come up? So these sensory maps are also uh, giving people the ability to plan ahead of time, that being I'm going to be triggered if I go to this part of the museum, so I'm going to go to the, to the West Wing, right? So I'm going to steer clear of this so that I can have a comfortable experience and uh, be able to focus on the art and what I'm looking at or the cultural heritage in front of me instead of being overwhelmed by um, uh, the sensory stimuli that I'm getting. Um, uh, so those types of things um, uh, go hand in hand, and that's very easy to do, and anyone can do it with, with basic, you know, software, PowerPoint, Canva, whatever you would like to do is take, a, take once again, a footprint of your institution exhibit and or um, even if it's outside right and then overlay those uh, those components on top of it I think it's a thank you for that it's, it, I think it's very important that uh, that all those in uh, that all the institutions uh, would understand uh, the the variety of the and inclusiveness of uh, their audience I think it's very important uh, that that the majority of population which uh, uh, people are different, can also enjoy uh, those uh, cultural experiences. Um, one thing that uh, one thing that I, I wanted to touch uh, base with you is um, is is about the measurement of uh, success of such technologies in, in terms of visitor satisfaction and engagement. Um, can you share your thoughts about that? Sure. So, I mean, it depends on what type of institution, if it's a public institution, a private one, if it's government funded, um, uh, how dependent one is on um, the local community and their various constituents for um, fundraising opportunities, etc. But um, um, uh, obviously, the, the, the tried and true and the more traditional way of gauging um, uh, the popularity, success and or clout of any given cultural institution would be the number of visitors per year, or you can break that down to the number of visitors per hour or per day as like the Louvre and the Met does um, uh, in that way. But um, uh, what that doesn't capture, however, is the engagement that the institution is getting um, uh, indirectly, um, which they can track once again by um, uh, by social media analytics and web analytics, um, which is free, by the way. So it's lifting up the hood and seeing who's visiting your site, what are the demographics, uh, who's engaging with your content, why, what type of content. Um, uh, so you can think about that, um, uh, both as far as website hits, as far as um, uh, downloads, as far as um, engagement on social media, um, uh, all of that leads to greater recognition um, uh, of the institution and obviously greater recognition and greater attention paid to a given collection um, uh, leads to uh, bigger and better things generally. So more access to, to funding, um, if there's ever going to be um, a UNESCO uh, kind of funds for um, uh, conservation efforts, right? Those, there's a limited number of them. So, you know, um, if we don't know about something, then um, obviously it's it's difficult to argue, you know, for its um, uh, historical or cultural significance to put funds into to uh, to restore. So um, you want the, uh, the public uh, visibility uh, globally, even if someone never physically visits the space. So for instance, you know, you're going to have an entire population in, uh, in the Americas that may never visit, you know, parts of Asia, but still, you know, knowing those locations and them coming out in publications, um, uh, people once again uh, purchasing um, uh, images, desktops, screensavers, posters, reproductions, um, etc., um, uh, all lead to um, uh, positive outcomes for institutions, even if no one can, can visit them. And so um, uh, we want to make sure that that the the uh, uh, the digital footprint um, uh, um, is also considered when considering success. 
makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, maybe the last question that uh, I would uh, like to ask you is, um, how do you see the future in not that far away, but in five, 10 years next time? I mean, nowadays, uh, people will go to a museum, wander around, uh, walk uh, around the, the exhibits. Uh, do you think, do you see it changing in the next uh, five, 10 years? And if so, how would it look like? Exactly. So um, we, we, we have a good indication um, of what things will look like in five years uh, based upon what has happened. And so we must, of course, go back and realize that we are in the most um, uh, technologically disruptive period in all of human history. So if we want to think about um, what we have just experienced, um, uh, people need to really take a step back. It's difficult to do because, you know, we can't write history books without some perspective, without being distanced from it to understand what was important, what was impactful, etc. So remember that 90% of all um, uh, data that was ever created um, uh, in human history was in the last two years. And think about that multiplied exponentially with large language models and these um, text to image and video generators that we have um, that allows for much more content on top of that to be created. So um, what we know is um, uh, uh, the ability to, and quantum computing comes next, the ability to create content um, uh, is going to outstrip what uh, the human mind is able to uh, uh, um, uh, interact with, engage with, and parse, right? So we're going to have to start thinking about um, uh, how we engage with data, content creation, et cetera, um, uh, and um, really creating custom AI curators, right, to assist us, right, as kind of co-pilots. Um, uh, to be able to think about things much more quickly and crunch the numbers for different demographics, trends, et cetera. I mean, you can go to trend God or God mode, et cetera. These are all things, you know, that you can look at that kind of compile everything that's going live. I mean, I think I think X now, which used to be Twitter, has that ability. So you can you can live go in and see what um, uh, what words are coming up, you know, um, uh, the most and rank them. Uh, Google Analytics has the same thing as well. So what that means is, um, uh, thanks to the pandemic, um, uh, putting massive billions, if not trillions of dollars into R&D, we had this um, a monumental leap forward in technological capacity and capabilities um, uh, with regards to uh, immersive technologies, extended reality, VR, AR, right? So we have passed that hurdle. And the initial hurdle, uh, these existed in commercial form back in 2015, if you think of the first um, Oculus headset, um, which is, of course, the first time in which OpenAI was starting their foundation models, um, along with Elon Musk, right? So the same year, but it took um, that time, right? Five years in order to uh, get past the initial expense of um, the technology. So you can see the graveyard of, uh, of older headsets behind me here of how quickly we are accelerating um, uh, and uh, moving through different types of models. And these are, these are very inexpensive. And so once the hardware became inexpensive and the ability to create content became more inexpensive and, um, uh, and uh, democratic egalitarian. So anyone with a smartphone, I mean, we have people in Burundi right now with smartphones that are, that, that are digitizing documents, right, just with basic cell phones, right? And so um, uh, the, the ability to do so um, uh, has moved away from specialists in this type of hardware to um, uh, the average consumer, the average user, the average museum visitor. So what that means is um, a custom um, a visit, custom content, and the ability to uh, deliver content in a multimodal way. So obviously, if we're talking about accessibility and inclusivity, uh, there are different learning types and people prefer different things. So some people um, prefer to read, some prefer to watch videos, some prefer to hear things read to them, right? And, um, and of course, you must think about the low vision or the blind population and tactile elements as well. Um, uh, so the ability to go between these different modalities is going to become much less expensive and easier and expected, right? So uh, the audiences are going to expect that, you know, to walk in and bare minimum now they want a QR code or something next to next to an um, a, a painting or a sculpture or next to a building that will give them at least textual information on what it is, if not a, 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 um, an augmented reality reconstruction of what that building looked like, you know, previously with uh, with, the, with the top on it before it was destroyed. Um, uh, so those are things people expect now, right? When you go to the Coliseum, et cetera. 
So moving in five years, um, um, uh, we, we've seen what happened just in 12 months with a stable launch of uh, ChatGPT, right? So uh, uh, starting off as something that hallucinated, that made up facts, that couldn't cite or quote things, to the new models, the latest ones with Gemini, uh, Four Turbo, Llama, um, uh, every major tech company, that's going to be paired with these immersive reality technologies so that it's not a passive experience. So if you want to think about the Viewmaster for when we were kids and you would flip through much like a stereograph, a stereoscope, I'm sorry, um, uh, and give you binocular vision of a particular site, maybe it's dinosaurs, maybe it's, you know, um, uh, the Taj Mahal, whatever that might be, it's still a passive experience because you are looking at it like a photograph. Now, fast forward, we had um, the early versions of the GoPro and of um, um, uh, the 360 still videos, right, that um, uh, now populate all of YouTube VR, right? So you can look at uh, uh, this collections of people, you know, uh, skydiving, yeah. skiing, going to the, you know, going to the pyramids, etc. But again, it's still passive, right? Even if you're moving, you are not controlling how you're moving through the environment. You are, you are, you are a passenger, right, on a ride. Um, uh, so to speak, right, in this way. So you, in a secondary way, get a sense of what the primary person experiencing it would have felt like, but you can't control it. You can't turn your head to the left necessarily if you wanted to or move off to the right. So this leads to the latest generation where you're pairing that ability to move freely through a space and then start um, in, in interacting and engaging with it. And that's kind of the next thing is haptics and olfactory experiences becoming more uh, more cheap and, uh, and easily available. Um, it's going to be something as simple as a, a wrist bracelet or just like an Apple watch that will send electrical impulses um, uh, up and down so you can feel textures, etc. So then uh, you'll be able to go into a museum not touching, hopefully, as, as I keep telling you, every time I take people and study abroad, I swear, it's like, do not touch anything. And then what do they do is go over and touch it. I'm like, no, no, don't do that. Um, uh, but you'll be able to to get the simulation of what it what the texture was. Is it velvet? Is it, you know, polished marble? Um, uh, is it is it rough leather? Um, et cetera, you'll be able to hear and then engage that being, you know, what is this, you know, so I'm going to go talk to uh, Auguste Rodin, or I'm going to go, you know, talk to um, uh, this historical figure, and I might be interested in different things than the next person. So it needs to be able to um, uh, understand what each visitor is um, is asking of it, and then have different types of um, uh, pre-programmed uh, personalities um, uh, and ways in which to respond, just just like we do when we go and we're we're out now for you know Christmas parties or whatever that might be coming up, um, uh, and you're with colleagues and then you're talking to them about work and then their spouse comes up and then you switch you code switch right in this way and start talking about more social things and then maybe you know their child is there so then you code switch again and talk about what they would be interested in in once again a vocabulary and nomenclature and the ways in which they're interested in. This is what we have to start thinking about in personalizing content that can easily personalize and switch and deliver information that balances what you're talking about, which is the authenticity with the engaging and immersive um, personalized experience, right? So for instance, you know, um, uh, uh, my wife loves historical costume, right? So every time there's a museum, she wants to go into that or we're watching a movie or whatever. And instead of paying attention to the narrative or the character, she's like, oh, look at that beautiful dress or they didn't have buttons or zippers at that time, right? So really just focusing on that one thing. So, um, uh, so like that, interest, um, you could have someone going into museums and just go, tell me about the history of this dress, right? Tell me about this type of garment, right? What about this pattern of damask, right, that they have on the wall? Um, was that Venetian? What did that represent, right? That it was associated with a particular doge, right? So um, uh, so they'll be able to then tailor that. Or someone who likes military history, right? So, um, um, uh, you know, going into the different sites and going, tell me more about this battle. Okay, so once again, who are the characters here? What was the geopolitical situation like at the time? You know, what tactics were used? Did they have what type of gunpowder or, you know, um, uh, ballistics were they using? 
So um, uh, the we have all this information. It's just that no human can tailor it in such a way to meet all those different uh, different audiences. Even if you're giving a tour, you're going to have you know 10, 20 people. I take students all the time abroad, and being able to stop and tailor each one of their interests um, is very time consuming. Um, but this can do it automatically, right? Because they can be going through. You you can have experts. You can have your curators. By the way, uh, this is really fun. If you're a curator and or a specialist in your collection or an archivist, you can make a digital twin of yourself, right, um, uh, uh, through things like HeyGen, which uploads two minutes of video. Um, it, it, it's free, right? And then you can it, you can then upload, once again, um, a series of, uh, uh, of documents, information, et cetera. And then you can be giving them uh, information yourself about um, a, a given um, uh, site, a given object, et cetera. So and that can be something as simple as just having a monitor up next to something, and then you're there as the curator and then people ask you questions, right? So that's something we can do now. But um, uh, so in five years, um, uh, given how quickly we're moving, um, uh, it's that type of personalized um, experience, not just in content and content delivery, but in sense experience, how bright is the interior? Uh, uh, what does it smell like? Um, uh, you know, if you want to be able to truly immerse someone, you know, going to the Roman baths, right? So uh, replicating what did the smell, you know, what, what was it like in there um, uh, as, as uh, people are going to be bathing and exercising, etc.? Um, uh, so the ability to personalize information, um, uh, to be able to um, relate to what you're interested in, and then uh, to be able to adjust sensory profiles, right, um, uh, as you're engaging with it. Um, uh, and that sounds, of course, entirely like science fiction, but it's going to be available to everyone, you know, regardless of your um, uh, uh, of your particular budget or size of your institution, because of how ubiquitous the technology will become. So, you know, arguably, we're, we're, we're already augmented uh, cybernetically um, uh, by carrying around these phones, right? So we have in, we can access anyone on the planet. We can access all the information um, uh, uh, that is ever stored, that humans ever created. Uh, we can curate it and catalog it, etc. So um, these are, are just going to become smaller and uh, more powerful, right, in this way. And so uh, instead of just getting access to information and content and communicating with people, it's going to be able to tailor our, uh, our experiences in, in, um, uh, w w without, without worrying about, you know, um, uh, actual biological augmentation. Sounds amazing. I mean, uh, one of the things that, uh, some of the things that I, I took from, um, from your insights is is that the fact that uh, that democratizing uh, content creation and democratizing uh, the uh, the devices that we uh, that we use to consume this content uh, drives mm -hmm. a lot of freedom and drives a lot of flexibility and personalization uh, for the experiences for the people that consume the experience. So um, there's so much to expect in the next uh, few years. Uh, especially in this industry, uh, also in other industries, but uh, in this, but specifically in uh, experiences, um, the experiences industry, I, I believe that uh, it, it will be, uh, as you say, a game changer um, for, for all of us. So um, just to summarize, uh, I want to thank, thank you a lot, James. Uh, it was so insightful and terrific. And uh, the amount of information that uh, that you can uh, share about both the technology and the research about all those uh, matters is 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 amazing. So uh, thank you for sharing all this knowledge with us today, and uh, a big thank uh, to uh, to you and everyone that is listening. I hope that uh, uh, that you all got uh, some great ideas for making museums and heritage sites more exciting with technology. Uh, please subscribe us, uh, leave a review, and tell us uh, what you think about uh, our uh, our uh, podcast, and share with your friends. So uh, join us uh, next time for more interesting interesting talks. Uh, saying goodbye until the next episode. Take care.